Watching a wheel moving might have made us think not only it is a wonderful piece of invention which has helping us in transportation over the centuries. In fact, it is one of the most common motions which are observed in daily life. If watched carefully, the wheel moves overall in straight line most of the times, but it simultaneously rotates. Where shall we place it in our category of motion? In translational or rotational? Perhaps in both. Then, does the mathematical results we have done in linear motion and circular motion can be applied directly here or they need some modification? When an object shows both translational and rotational motion simultaneously, then it is said to be in rolling motion. As a rolling motion comprises of superposition of two types of motion, translational and rotational, therefore it needs visualization from both these perspectives. If one watches carefully a rolling wheel on a flat surface, it is a combination of rotation, rotation about an axis passing through its center and parallel to the ground and pure translation which is the center of the wheel shows motion along a straight line parallel to the ground. We shall begin with the case of a disc rolling along a flat surface, but the results will apply to any rolling object like circular or spherical objects capable of rolling such as sphere, cylinder, ring, etc. rolling on a leveled surface. Let us first consider a rotational aspect of a rolling disc or a wheel. Consider a disc undergoing pure rotation about a fixed axis passing through its center with angular velocity omega. Each particle of the rotating disc moves with same angular velocity in the figure. We have shown the linear velocities of the particle occupying four positions on the rim with appropriate vectors due to the angular velocities of the body. The magnitude of linear velocities of these four particles A, B, C and P on the rim resulting from the pure rotation are given as V r which is velocity linear due to rotational motion is equal to omega into r. r is the radius of the disc. This gives us uh, equation number 1. However, if we consider a particle q inside the disc at a distance small r from the center o, then its magnitude of linear velocity resulting from pure rotation can be written as v is equal to omega into small r which gives us equation number 2. The direction of the linear velocity due to the rotational motion of the disc is tangent to the circular path traced by the particle under the consideration as shown in the figure. Substituting the value of omega from equation number 1 which is omega is equal to v upon capital R. The in equation number 2, we can obtain the magnitude of linear velocity of the particle which is inside the rotating disc. We get v is equal to v r into small r divided by capital R, where r is the linear distance of the position occupied by the particle from the axis of rotation and capital R is the radius of the disc. Therefore, the linear velocity of every particle due to rotational motion of the disc are different while they all have same angular velocities. Now, consider the given disc to be in pure translational motion. Then each particle of the disc is moving with linear velocity that is of the center of mass which is represented as Vcm. The translatory velocity can be written as V translation is equal to Vcm. Unlike the case of pure rotation, each of the particle whether situated on the rim or within the disc is moving with same velocity here. The linear velocities of the particle with appropriate vectors have been shown in the figure for points A, 
B, C, which are on the rim of the disc. Now, we will consider a disc whose translation motion is superimposed with rotational motion as we were discussing prior. The net velocity of the particles on the disc will be obtained by adding the two velocity vectors, one due to pure rotation and the other due to pure translation. That is, net velocity of any particle on the disc will be equal to V net is equal to V r vector plus V c m vector, where V r vector is due to rotational motion and V c m is due to the translation motion. One can observe in the figure that the bottom most point P, which is also the point of contact has velocity V c m because of translation in forward direction, but the velocity V r which is due to the rotational motion is in the backward direction. While the two velocities at point B and C are perpendicular to each other and at point A which is the topmost point, the velocity are along the same direction. Depending upon the magnitude of V r which is the rotational motion velocity, we can have different types of rolling motion. When the magnitude of V r which is equal to r omega is equal to magnitude of V c m velocity. That is, the translational velocity of center of mass has a magnitude r times the angular velocity. We would have a state of pure rolling for such an object. It would mean that the velocity of the bottom most point or the point of contact will be 0, which is how we define pure rolling. It also means the frictional force either will be not present at the point of contact or static frictional force will be present, as there is no relative motion between the two surfaces in contact. The second case, when the magnitude of rotational velocity which is V r is equal to r omega, which is less than the magnitude of velocity of center of mass. It means that the disc is translating faster as compared to rotational motion. In this case, for the point of contact, we have a non-zero velocity in forward direction. This indicates forward slipping. For example, when on a wet road, a cycle tire slides more but rotates less the cycle in that case have a forward slipping. Case 3, when the magnitude of velocity due to rotational motion, which is also equal to r omega, is more than the magnitude of velocity of center of mass. It means that the disc is translating slower as compared to the rotational motion. In this case, for the point of contact, we have a non-zero velocity in backward direction. This implies backward slipping. For example, when on a muddy road, a car tire rotates more but moves forward less as compared to its rotational motion. The car is said to have a backward slipping. We will try to investigate the pure rolling and its constraints further. It is to be noted that in pure rolling, the point of contact has zero instantaneous velocity resulting from equal and opposite linear velocities due to pure rotation and pure translation. Nevertheless, it has finite angular velocity that changes its position with time. The moment a particle occupying a contact position changes its position, it acquires finite linear velocity as the particle is no longer at the contact point and the velocities resulting from the two constituent motion are not equal and opposite. The velocities of four particles A, B, C and P taken at the rim of the disc in case of pure rolling can be shown in the figure as let us say we start with particle at point P, which is at the point of contact. We know that net velocity of particle at point P is 0. 
for particle A which is the topmost point, the velocity V r and V c m have same magnitudes and direction. That means, V net for point A will be twice of V c m. For particle B and C, as both V r and V c m have same magnitudes, but they are perpendicular to each other. Hence, the net velocity for point B and C, it will be root 2 times the velocity at center of mass. Therefore, the net velocity of a particle on the disk will depend upon the position of the particle and we can do a small activity to observe this thing. One can deduce the constraints for pure rolling as first the translational speed of center of mass of rolling object is related with the angular speed about its center of mass as V c m is equal to r omega. Let it be equation number 3. The equation 3 can be differentiated further with respect to time and we get acceleration of the center of mass can be written as r times the derivative of omega which becomes alpha or angular acceleration. So, A c m is equal to r times alpha which is our equation number 4. That means, the magnitude of acceleration of center of mass is equal to the product of radius of the object r and the magnitude of angular acceleration alpha of the object about its center of mass. Third, if one integrates the equation 3 with respect to time, we get delta x c m is equal to r times delta theta. The magnitude of displacement of center of mass that means, is equal to the product of radius and the angular displacement of the object about an axis through its center of mass. Let us now try to find out the instantaneous center of a rolling body. For a disc undergoing pure rolling motion as we have talked now, we know the point of contact P of the disc which surface does not slip, which means the point P has zero velocity with respect to center of mass. Therefore, the moment the point P on the disc comes to the contact to the surface, it becomes an instantaneous center. The net speed of point A, the topmost point determined earlier can be rewritten in terms of distance from the point of contact and the angular speed as V net A which is twice of V c m can be written as twice of r into omega. Twice of r is also the distance a p, distance between the, the point of contact and the topmost point into omega. Also the angular velocity of point a, the topmost point on the rim of the disc is perpendicular to the segment a p. Similarly, for point b and c, let us say for point b, the net velocity for b is root 2 times V c m, which can be also written as root 2 into r times omega. We can find out using Pythagoras theorem, the distance B p can be written as root 2 times r. Therefore, net velocity of point B can be written as B p into omega. Also, one can work out and find out that velocity at this location is perpendicular to the segment joining the point of contact P and the points on the disc B or C. This shows that the point of contact is actually acting as an instantaneous center for a rolling disc. That is, the disc is exhibiting pure rotation about the point of contact P. So, for a person standing on the ground, the disc is rolling, but for an observer at point P, that is the point of contact the disc is actually only showing rotational motion. This fact can be used to determine velocities of other points on the disc using the expression net velocity will be equal to omega times small d, where omega is the angular velocity of the object and d is the distance of the point taken on the disc from the point of contact. Also, more distant a point on the wheel is from the instant center p, larger is its net speed. We will do a small activity where we will try to see whether the topmost point of a pure rolling object 
really moves with twice the velocity of the center of a pure rolling object. We have a small cylinder here and a scale. What we will do? We will make this cylinder roll with pure motion, pure rolling with the help of this scale. How can we do that? Make sure the scale never slides over the cylinder. Now you focus on the point which is marked at the center of the cylinder and the topmost point is actually the motion of the edge of the scale itself. Let us say this is my initial point which is marked by this reference. Now we will make the cylinder roll purely. Make sure the scale should not slide over the cylinder. For this you might have to slide, you might have to press the scale slightly. Now we have reached to a certain point. So this is the another reference where the center of cylinder has reached. Look at where the end of the scale has reached. Here we will have the reference for this one also. Now we have seen that the tip of the scale actually moved twice the distance moved by the center of the rolling object. But how can we say that the velocity of the topmost point was actually double of that? What have we done? We have made sure the scale does not slide over the cylinder. That means every time the velocity of the scale was equal to the topmost point of the cylinder. With the help of this but small activity, we have just paid, we have just observed that a topmost point in case of pure rolling will be always double the velocity of the center of the rolling object. Let us do a problem based on the concepts we have just learnt. A solid disc of mass M has a thin string wrapped several times around its circumference. The string is fixed at one end and the disc is released. Determine the magnitude of downward acceleration of the disc and the tension in the string as shown in the figure. To solve this particular problem, let us think of the forces which are acting on the disc first. There are two forces primarily acting on the disc. First, weight which is acting downward, tension which is acting upwards. As shown in the figure, and we can then using the FBD diagram, we can write the force equation as for the translation motion, net force will be written as mg or the weight plus tension. Since the two forces are in opposite direction, using the coordinate system, we can write F net vector as minus mg j cap plus tension j cap. Net force becomes mg minus T, net force is in vertically downward direction. The net force can be also written as mass times the acceleration of center of mass. This gives us equation first, where ACM is the acceleration of the center of mass of the disc. For the rotational motion of the disc about its center of mass O, we can write net torque will be equal to torque 1 plus torque 2 vector sum, where torque 1 is the torque due to mg or the weight, here it is 0 as the force passes through the axis of rotation of the disc, while the torque 2 is due to the tension whose magnitude can be given as tau 2 will be equal to r into t into sin of 90 degree. Also using right hand palm rule, we can find out the direction as clockwise, angle is taken 90 degree as the angle between the radial vector, the radius vector and the tension is 90 degree. Therefore, the magnitude of net torque can be written as net torque is equal to RT. It can be further written as ICM into alpha which gives us equation number 2. Here alpha is the angular acceleration of the disc about the axis which is passing through its center of mass and ICM is the moment of inertia of the disc about the axis which is passing through its center of mass. Using equation 1 and 2, one can write m into ACM is equal to 
m g minus i c m alpha upon r. Let it be equation number 3. Also for a pure rolling motion a c m can be written as r alpha. This we have deduced from the conditions for pure rolling. Substituting the value of alpha as a c m upon r in equation number 3, we can get a c m is equal to m times r square into small g divided by m r square plus i c m. The moment of inertia of the disc about its center of mass can be written as i c m is equal to half m r square as it is a disc. Substituting i c m in the equation 4, we can get a c m is equal to 2 g upon 3. For the value of tension, we can use equation number 3 on substituting the value of a c m or alpha, we can get t is equal to i c m alpha upon r or half m r square into a c m upon r into r. Therefore, we get tension is equal to m g by 3. Let us do another problem where both translatory and rotational motion are involved. A uniform ring of mass m and radius r is projected with horizontally certain velocity v naught on a rough horizontal floor so that it starts off with pure sliding motion at t equal to 0. Then from t equal to t naught the ring shows pure rolling motion as shown in the figure. First part, calculate the velocity of the center of mass of the disc at t equal to t naught when it starts showing pure rolling motion. Second part, assume the coefficient of friction to be mu, calculate the time t naught it takes to show pure rolling motion. Let us solve the problem. During the time interval t equal to 0 to t equal to t naught, there is a forward sliding as a translational motion dominates over the rotational motion. The frictional force is kinetic in nature and its direction will be opposite to the velocity of center of mass. For this interval, net force on the body will be first force, weight acting vertically downward, second force, normal reaction and it is acting vertically upward. The third force is the kinetic friction represented as small f acting horizontally in left direction. Net force on the body will help us to find the acceleration of the center of mass. Along the y axis or the vertical axis, the net force is 0. Therefore, normal reaction will be equal to the weight of the body. While along x axis, the net force can be written as minus f is equal to m times the acceleration of center of mass. Since we know friction force is equal to mu times normal reaction and the normal reaction is equal to weight, therefore frictional force magnitude is equal to mu times the weight of the body. Therefore, the acceleration of the center of mass can be written as ACM is equal to minus f upon capital M or minus mu times n upon capital M or ACM can be written as simply minus mu times small g. The negative sign here is telling the object is showing retardation. If v is the velocity of the center of mass at t equal to t naught, then using equation of motion we can write v is equal to u plus a t, v is equal to v naught minus mu times g into t naught. This gives us equation number 1. Net torque on the body will help us to find angular acceleration of the body during the interval 0 to t equal to t naught. As three forces acting on the body described above, the torques on the body due to them can be given as first torque due to weight will be 0 as it passes through center of mass of the body. Second, Torque due to normal reaction from the floor will be also 0 as it also passes through the center of mass of the body. Third, the torque due to frictional force can be written as tau is equal to r into f into sin theta, small r the distance between the point of application of force and the center about which it rotates 
is capital R. So, torque becomes capital R into F into sin of 90. So, the magnitude of torque becomes R times mu times mg. As we know, net torque is equal to moment of inertia into angular acceleration that is I times alpha. Therefore, alpha can be written as torque upon moment of inertia. Hence, it becomes R times mu into m into g divided by I which is moment of inertia. Let omega be the angular velocity of the body at t equal to t naught. Then using equation of motion for rotational motion we can write omega is equal to omega naught plus alpha t. Hence here omega naught is 0, the object starts rotating from rest, omega can be written as mu times r into mg into t naught divided by moment of inertia. Let it be equation number 2. As a motion of the body is pure rolling at t equal to t naught, therefore using the constraint of pure rolling that is Vcm is equal to r omega from equation 1 and 2 in the above constraint we can get V naught minus mu times g into t naught is equal to r into r into mu mg upon i into t naught. If we simplify, we can get t naught is equal to v naught divided by mu times small g within the brackets 1 plus m r square upon i. As we know, k square or where k is the radius of gyration, square of this can be written as moment of inertia divided by mass into r square, where then the time taken to attain pure rolling can be written as t naught is equal to v naught divided by mu times small g within the brackets 1 plus 1 upon k square. This gives us equation number 3. Using equation 1 and 3, speed of center of mass of the rolling body can be determined at t equal to t naught. Therefore, the speed becomes v is equal to v naught minus mu times small g v naught upon mu g within the brackets 1 plus 1 upon k square. If you simplify this thing, we get v is equal to v naught 1 plus k square. This gives us equation number 4. The expression 3 and 4 in fact can be written as general equation. We have to know only about the square of the radius of gyration and we can use it for every rolling object. Here the rolling object is ring, therefore k square can be determined as I upon m r square. The moment of inertia of the ring about the center of mass is m r square, therefore k square is 1 or the value of k is 1. Hence the speed of center of mass of the ring at t equal to t naught becomes v is equal to v naught 1 plus k square. We substitute the value of k as 1 here, so v becomes v naught upon 2. The time taken to attain pure rolling by the ring can be determined as t naught is equal to v naught divided by mu times small g within the brackets 1 plus 1 upon k square. Substituting the value of k as 1 in this, we get v naught upon 2 times mu into small g. Now, we have done the translation motion and rotational motion. Can we find the expression for kinetic energy of a rolling body? As we have seen, the motion of a rolling body can be considered as superposition of translational and rotational motion. For a body of mass m, whose center of mass is moving with velocity vcm and is rotating simultaneously about its center of mass with angular velocity omega. Therefore, the kinetic energy of rolling body can be expressed as kinetic energy rolling is equal to kinetic energy due to translational motion plus kinetic energy due to rotational motion. Therefore, kinetic energy rolling will be equal to half m vcm square plus half icm omega square. This gives us equation number 1 where ICM is the moment of inertia of the body about an axis which is passing through its center of mass. And for a body undergoing pure rolling, the speed of the center of mass is related with the angular speed as Vcm is equal to r omega. 
that would be our equation number 2. From equation 1 and 2 kinetic energy of rolling body can be written as kinetic energy rolling is equal to half m times square of r and omega plus half i c m into omega square which can be further simplified as half can be taken common m r square plus i c m into omega square can be also taken common. This gives us equation number 3. Using parallel axis theorem, the moment of inertia of the body about the point of contact can be written as moment of inertia about point P, I P is equal to m r square plus I C m. This gives us equation number 4. From equation 3 and 4, we can write kinetic energy rolling as half I P omega square. This gives us equation number 5. Hence, we can express the kinetic energy of a rolling body either as a sum of a translational and rotational kinetic energy as given by equation 1 or as rotational kinetic energy about its point of contact as given by equation number 5. Let us do a problem based on the energy of a rolling object. A ball of radius r and mass m is rolling without slipping on a horizontal surface with a speed v. It then rolls without slipping up an inclined plane to a height h before momentarily coming to rest. Determine the value of the height h. Let us solve this problem. As static friction is involved here, which will not do any work, therefore conservation of mechanical energy can be used. Initial mechanical energy will be equal to final mechanical energy. That means initial kinetic energy plus initial potential energy will be equal to final kinetic energy and final potential energy. Considering the horizontal level of the center of mass to be the reference level for potential energy, then we can write initial kinetic energy as half m v c m square plus half i c m omega square because initially the body has both the rolling and the translatory motion while the initial potential energy can be written as 0. Final kinetic energy will be taken as 0 as the body comes to momentarily rest at that point while final potential energy will be taken as m g h. Therefore, we can write half m v c m v c m square plus half i c m omega square plus 0 is equal to 0 plus m g h. Substituting omega is equal to v c m upon r as the motion was initially pure rolling, we can write h as half taken common m v c m square plus i c m into v c m square divided by r square bracket closes, the whole is divided by m g. So, h becomes v c m square 1 plus i c m upon m r square the whole divided by 2g this gives us equation number 1. The above expression again can be used as a general expression for any rolling object one can conclude for a body of higher moment of inertia about its center of mass for a given mass and radius will reach to greater height. The factor i c m upon m r square is also equal to the square of the radius of gyration. Therefore, h can be written as v c m square 1 plus k square upon 2 g. Here we have solid sphere whose moment of inertia about the center is i c m is equal to 2 by 5 m r square. Substituting the value of i c m in the equation 1, we obtain h is equal to 7 times v c m square upon 10 g. Now, we can summarize what we have learned today. Firstly, in rolling motion, the translational motion is superimposed with rotational motion of a given object. The net velocity of particle on the object will be obtained by adding the two velocities which are due to pure rotation and due to pure translation. That is net velocity can be written as v r vector plus v c m vector where v r is the linear velocity of the particle due to rotational motion where v c m is the velocity of the particle due to translatory motion. 
Secondly, for rolling motion without slipping, also called pure rolling, the translation motion of the center of mass of rolling will be related with the angular speed about its center of mass that is Vcm is equal to r omega, where Vcm is the velocity of translation that is velocity of the center of mass and r is the radius and omega is the angular speed about the center of mass of the body. The point of contact will be at rest and there will be no relative motion between the body and the surface in contact. Also, the pure rolling object will be effectively rotating about the point of contact which acts as an instantaneous center. Third, the kinetic energy of such a rolling object is sum of kinetic energies of translation and rotation. That means kinetic energy rolling can be written as half m v c m square plus half i c m omega square, where m is the mass of the body and v c m is the velocity of center of mass and omega is the angular velocity of the rotating object. With this, we conclude our learning of rolling motion. Thank you.